Right, uh, are we all here? You expect anyone else to come? Okay. Um, I need to get my chewing gum. There's no bin anywhere. Oh, well. No, I want to get rid of my chewing gum. Right, so, hello. so you've had several of these all day, haven't you? Or, and you're all tired and fed up now and you want to go home. But unfortunately I have to give this lecture, I've been told. I've uh, just mashed together some slides from various lectures actually for this. Um, I hope I can make a coherent story. Um, and what I'm going to look at is the area that I'm interested in, which is how we use new sequencing technologies in clinical microbiology. Uh, I'm the professor of microbial genomics here at the University of Birmingham. What I'm doing is I'm recording this, so I'm recording my voice and the slide synchronised, so that I'll then put it up onto YouTube, so you can look at it as a slide cast if you fall asleep this afternoon and need to go and revise it again. If anyone's got a USB stick afterwards, then if you want to take a copy of the PowerPoint slides, I'd be happy to do that as well. So, I'm going to look at what high-throughput sequencing is. Have you had any lectures on high-throughput sequencing? Yeah. Yeah. Not just normal sequencing, but high-throughput sequencing. You've had that as well. So I, I can go quickly through then, because you know it all. And then look at how we apply it in clinical microbiology and look at a couple of case studies from our own work. And then look at how microbiology might look in the future in a five years or ten year kind of frame and how things are moving forward and what our aspirations are in pushing them forward. So let's start by dissing my discipline, if you like. Uh, diagnostic microbiology, particularly diagnostic bacteriology, is stuck in a kind of time warp. We're using technologies that were actually developed in the 19th century. Uh, using microscopes and, and culturing things on solid media. <coughs> These are methodologies that come from the time of Graham and Koch and Pasteur. And uh, what we do now wouldn't be that unfamiliar to them. And what our vision is in my group is that we would actually move forward to using high-throughput sequencing as a method of choice in the diagnosis of infection. And actually, medical microbiology just becomes a branch of clinical chemistry or genomic medicine. Now, I put this up. This actually scandalises medical microbiologists. They hate this idea, but I put it up just to provoke the audience at the outset. Now, as I say, you, it, you said you've already had some stuff on high-throughput sequencing. It, it's, it's a great step forward that we've seen in the last five years or so. It, it's what we might call a disruptive technology because... It really changes the landscape of what we can do. Uh, it's so much cheaper, so much faster. It opens up whole new uh, avenues for investigation. It relies on fundamentally new approaches. And a key feature is that there is such lively competition here. We have uh, various alternative platforms all competing with each other. And that's <coughs> driving forward innovation. And uh, I've used the term permanent revolution to describe this. So if someone comes to me and says, I want some costings for a grant proposal and I want to do some sequencing in the third year so three or four years from now I can you tell me what it will cost and you say no there's absolutely no way I, I can give you the costings of what it will cost now and you better use those but we can't um, go beyond that has that happened a lot <laughs> okay um, <laughs> okay uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Nick Lohman, has, has used the term hyper-Moore's law. So you may be familiar with Moore's law with computers. So you buy a laptop now, uh, for a thousand pounds you'll get one specification. But you know that if you came back in six months or a year with your thousand pounds, you'd get something much better. Uh, it would be faster and, and have a larger hard drive and so on. And we're seeing exactly the same kind of relentless progress in this discipline. One of the advantages of sequencing, as opposed to things like um, culture or, or specific kits aimed at specific organisms, is it brings this kind of open-endedness. We can just look at what DNA or RNA is there in a completely uh, assumption-free approach. And because 
almost all infectious agents have RNA or DNA. They have sequences that we can sequence. It's kind of universal in applicability. Does anyone think of the one infectious agent that we won't have any sequences for? There is actually agents called prions, which are cause things like mad cow disease, BSE, which, and Kreutzfeldt Jakob, which don't have any DNA associated with their infectious proteins. But they are very rare. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of, of, of infectious agents, this approach will work. It also gives us the ultimate in resolution. So we can sequence, to, you know, down to the single base pair change between two uh, isolates from say, patients in adjacent beds or in, in different wards in the hospital. And one of the great changes in the last, well, about a year, really, 18 months to a year, is that we have seen the emergence of what we call benchtop sequencing platforms. So these are platforms where they're, they're about the size of a laser printer. They'd fit on a table like this, and uh, they have workflows and reagent costs which really are amenable to doing uh, sort of diagnostic work. Uh, so we're talking hundreds of pounds or less per, per run and per sample than, uh, com as compared to, say, tens of thousands of pounds um, a few years ago. Now, this is a very busy slide. We just had a review out, actually, in Nature Reviews Microbiology, where we reviewed these technologies and their potential approaches, potential applications in microbiology. And I'm not going to take you through uh, all of this in detail, but basically you can see that there are some commonalities in the workflows between different platforms and there are some variations as well. We start off with a template, uh, genomic DNA. Um, we have to make sure we have the right quality and quantity of DNA. For most of these workflows, we have to fragment that DNA and then tag the DNA, put little uh, tags, adapters on the ends of it. And then there is usually an amplification step where we create enough template for sequencing and that's done in what we call a solid phase format, either done on the surface of beads or on the two-dimensional surface. And then we do the sequencing itself. There's a bit of an overgeneralization there in that there are some technologies where you don't have to do amplification, so-called single molecule sequencing um, but those have not yet been widely adopted uh, throughout the community. This is a, a table from the same review. Um, <coughs> the only single uh, molecule sequencing technology that's currently at market, at least that's any good, uh, is this PacBio system. Um, the problem with that is that it costs uh, three quarters of a million dollars to buy one of these instruments, and they're about the size of a of a large lorry. Um, in fact, there's a video on YouTube of one being delivered to a sequencing centre in Germany where they had to actually knock out the window on the side of a building and, and lift it up through a crane. But nonetheless, it, it's a proof of principle. It does uh, great stuff and gives us uh, the single molecule reads and uh, quite long reads. Most of the rest of it, I mean, I think as far as I'm aware, there's only one of those instruments in the UK. The rest of us are dealing with these benchtop instruments uh, for the most part, and I'm not going to go through all of those issues there, but the, the key point is we haven't got perfection yet. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages with each of these different platforms in terms of read length, throughput, cost, and, and so forth. That's not supposed to happen, is it? I'm not supposed to get phoned. Go away. Um... Now, one of the areas that we're interested in, it's now bloody throbbing away in my pocket. Just, uh, if I open it, I, I think I get the chance to decline the call, but maybe, maybe not. Hello? I'm teaching. <laughs> Goodbye. That's it. Right. No. Just, just, just ignore it. I should have turned it off, shouldn't I? So, so we've got, one of the great area, great things in our. Um, in my discipline, is that we're actually starting to use these technologies for epidemiology, so we can trace the spread of organisms at exquisite levels. <laughs> but just go away, Bella. Let's just switch it off. I thought there's normally a chance to actually decline a message. 
<laughs> just put it in the bin, yeah. Well, I did answer. I just said, hello, I'm teaching. And told her, the you know, I thought that would be enough. But anyway, she'll have to just go away. Um, it's, someone, it's one of my fellow microbiologists. I'm meeting at half past three, so she'll have to wait till then. Now, let's get back to the subject. <laughs> There's been a crop of papers here, and this is an illustrative list, not an exhaustive list, of where you can actually use whole genome sequencing using these approaches to track the spread of organisms and where they've come from. So one famous example was looking at this so-called Amerithrax incident, which you may have heard of. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a deliberate contamination of the U.S. postal system with anthrax spores. And using a, a combination of conventional microbiology and genome sequencing, they were able to track down the actual culture that was used for that, uh, those purposes and the individual who was in charge of that culture. He committed suicide, so there's not going to be a court case, but the, the uh, Department of Justice in the US has actually closed the case on the basis of this evidence. Another controversial uh, use of this technology has been actually looking at cholera in Haiti. So they sequenced uh, the, the cholera strains from Haiti during the Haitian outbreak and showed that they weren't related to anything else that was going on in the Caribbean. And the closest related strains were from actually from Asia. Uh, and in fact, um, at this, with this very first paper, they said probably the Nepalese peacekeepers who'd been sent in by uh, the UN as the source of infection. Subsequent papers actually narrowed it down much more. It was rather speculative with the first paper, but subsequent papers did actually establish really beyond, I think, reason for doubt that it was the Nepalese peacekeepers that had brought uh, ha uh, cholera to Haiti. And this obviously had tremendous uh, political kickback because the Haitians then blamed the UN and, and it wasn't a, very, wasn't a nice result, but it was the truth uh, as, as revealed by these technologies. A bit of a whimsy there, a bit of whimsy there. If you go to the southern United States, you find that people do all sorts of strange things, you know, in the, the kind of rednecks in the backwoods. And people there eat roadkill, and they eat wild animals. And what they found in this study uh, is one of those kind of pub quiz facts that the only organism, the only animal that gets leprosy apart from us, anyone know the answer? Nearly the nine-banded armadillo. And the nine-banded armadillo, well, it's not like a raccoon, but... Anyway, that's, that's the organism that gets it, and these, uh, there are individuals who go and get that, those kind of organisms, skin them and eat them. And they showed, by sequencing the genomes of the leprosy bacillus, or looking for particular SNPs they discovered from ge genome sequencing elsewhere, that there was a plausible epidemiological link between eating armadillos and catching leprosy. So, you know, next time you go to the Deep South, have a look at what's on the menu and be a bit careful. Here are some more recent, uh, perhaps more focused uh, articles looking at these kind of applications in hospital <coughs> infection. So using genome sequencing to look at the uh, modes of spread of hospital pathogens, MRSA, Staphylococcus aureus, another one there on Clostridium difficile and Staph aureus. And here the context is, have you got an outbreak in front of you? You've got, suddenly got you know, 10 isolates coming out of a ward is it that basically it's just a dirty, grotty ward and that hygiene is people stop washing their hands and <coughs> stuff? Or is it actually that there's an outbreak, that there's one epidemic strain that is now propagating its way through your um, healthcare facility? And the, this kind of approach can actually resolve that quite easily and also show the patterns of spread. And I'll illustrate that from some of our own work in a while. Interesting review that's come out uh, recently, I mean, we're, there's probably uh, maybe three main groups doing this kind of stuff in the, in the country. Birmingham is one of them. This, this is a review from our competitors in Oxford. There are also uh, some people doing this kind of stuff in Cambridge. And there are a couple of other kind of bit players at the moment uh, in London and in Stanglia. Um, but the, the, the Oxford people have made, produced a very nice review here, which you can uh, look up if you're interested. And what I've stolen from their review here 
is what we're up against in terms of traditional microbiology and why we might start thinking about using genome-based approaches. Now, of course, there's a caveat that you know, genome sequencing is rather just an order of magnitude, perhaps, or it's more expensive than we'd like at the moment. But what are we up against here? Well, if we look at the way traditional microbiology is done, you have lots of different sorts of specimens. You have to propagate those, take those out on lots of different kinds of media. So what you do with a stool sample will be different from what you do with a urine sample, different from what you do with a blood culture sample. So you have a very complex workflow in the microbiology lab. Once you get colonies growing on your solid media, then, then you can do the gram stain and uh, try and start working out what kind of thing you're looking at. You might get some presumptive idea, okay, so you've done a gram stain and you see things that look like staphylococci and given the context you might think, ah, oh, so we'll, we'll treat this as if it's staph aureus and, 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 and so on. But species identification might take a bit longer. In fact, there has been a transformation in many labs, not, not unfortunately yet here in, in, in the Curie, with the use of a technique called Molditoff, which does give very rapid uh, speciation. But, you know, get, getting, getting that all nailed down and, and done properly takes a few more days, and then you've got to do susceptibility testing. And because different organisms grow in, 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 under different conditions, you're going to have different ways of doing that. So, so you basically have this very complicated workflow and the hope is that in the future, you could replace all that by just taking your colonies and sticking them into a sequencer and analysing the DNA sequences that you get uh, in a smart fashion to give you all the same kinds of information that you would have got in, by conventional approaches, but also much more. So in terms of relatedness, speciation, but also epidemiological information. So drawing on our own research, let's start with a case study uh, number one, which is uh, on an organism called Acinetobacter baumannii. This is a gram-negative bacterium. It's multidrug resistant. Um, it's fact moving to what we might call pan-resistance, resistance to every antibiotic. Uh, there are these two antibiotics that are kind of like the finger in the dike at the moment, uh, colistin and tigercycline. But there are some strains that have been described that are resistant even to them. This organism is associated with wound infections, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. It sometimes gets in, into the blood and we isolate from blood cultures. It's particularly been seen in returning military personnel from Iraq and Af initially and then uh, also now from, from Afghanistan. As you probably know, this is the place where all our returning military casualties get repatriated. And we have seen here and in other contexts across the world, so in North America, this has been seen as well, is that you get military patients cared for in the same facility as for civilian patients and you get cross-infection. So we've been looking at the, the kind of question of could we use whole genome sequencing to detect differences between isolates within an outbreak? You know, if, we, if we sequenced a lot of isolates from an outbreak, would they all be the same at the genome level? Would they be different? They show lots of differences or a few. Would we be able to interpret those differences to actually help us determine chains of transmission or transmission events? And also, you know, how, how does resistance emerge? What are the mechanisms? Can we shed light on that by sequencing genomes? So we started uh, on this a, a couple of years ago, three years ago now. Um, we looked at some uh, isolates from an outbreak in Birmingham, actually, where it's when the patient was still in Celiac Hospital back in 2008. And we had uh, a clutch of isolates that were indistinguishable by current typing methods. So you can send isolates off from the local uh, laboratory off to the reference laboratory in London. They have sophisticated typing methods that will uh, be able to say, yes, they're all part of an outbreak, they're indistinguishable, that's an outbreak clone, but they don't get beyond that. They never show you anything further than that. And that was the situation here. So what we used was an old platform, 454 sequencing, um, and we detected what we call SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, by mapping those reads. And ended up with three loci in the genome where we could see SNPs. Now, at the time we did this, we were quite early on, you know, quite pioneering, and lots of people just said, this is silly. This is a sledgehammer to crack a nut, you know. 
just to get three snips. But, you know, we, th we were quite encouraged and um, we didn't know what we were going to get. We, we, we thought they might all be the same or, we, or they might be just erratic and uninterpretable. But this is the pattern we got. What we did was we looked at an unrelated strain uh, and said, OK, that represents the outgroup. That will give us the ancestral state at each of these three loci. Um, and then we could start to make predictions from there. Now, when you tabulate it like that, it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense. The M1 to 4 are military patients, 1 to 4, and C1 to uh, 2 civilian patients. But if we actually map this onto time and space evidence that we have about the outbreak, it actually does start to make a bit more sense. If you notice here that we've got this TAG genotype occurring three times, and at the top there we've got M2 and C2 actually in this six-bedded unit overlapping for a, about a week or just under a week in adjacent beds. The military patient there with the first isolation in, in towards the end of week four and then this C2 patient in week seven. Same genotype. And what we interpreted that to mean was that there had been a transmission event from one patient to the other. There's, a, there's the most parsimonious explanation there. Now, as I say, you may well, and some of my colleagues did say, well, that is all a bit, you know, you've done an awful lot of effort just to make a conclusion, which is you know, fairly straightforward and seems fairly obvious after the event anyway. But I'll explain how when we get to more difficult situations, actually, these kind of interpretations can be useful. I am mindful of the fact it's Friday afternoon and most of you are probably half asleep. But you might have noticed that there is something slightly anomalous here as well. I've glossed over something. Has anyone noticed something? That you think stick out? I'm trying to tell you a kind of Jack and Ori story that all makes sense. Well, if you look at the bottom there, you've got this TAG phenotype in this other patient, M4, on a completely different ward. So if this is a way of showing that cross-infection is going on within our hospital, there's something funny going on there. Well, we dug down into the notes, and what we found was actually M4 and M2, they're both military patients, and they were both repatriated to the hospital at the same time through the same care pathways. And so we assume that they were actually, they actually acquired this uh, colonisation with this organism shortly before they arrived in the hospital, and that accounts for the fact they've got the same genotype. So a little while after that, we looked at, uh, with some colleagues in London in a collaborative study. We looked at what happened to uh, this organism on the same patient while the pa after, before and after the patient received treatment with this relatively new drug, Tiger Cycling. And um, so we sequenced the genome before, sequenced the genome after. And here we found actually a lot of SNPs, rather more than we'd found in the previous um, outbreak. And this is quite unexpected because this is the same patient. There we were struggling to find SNPs between different patients. Here we found 18 SNPs in the same patient. What we also found when we looked at where those SNPs were and where the uh, changes were, um, we, we could make sense of the resistance phenotype because there was a SNP in a gene that had already been associated with the resistance to tiger cycling in this organism. So this ADES is actually a regulator, part of a regulatory um, network that uh, regulates efflux pumps. And that gave us an, uh, uh, an explanation for the resistance. But we also found something quite counterintuitive. When you think about organisms acquiring resistance, particularly bacteria, you, I don't know how much bacteriology you've already done, but we usually think about them requiring mobile genetic elements like plasmids that bring in lots of resistance genes. And so acquiring resistance or becoming resistance is all about getting new DNA. What we found here was, in fact, the later strain had bits of its genome missing, or dropped out since the earlier strain. And one of those... Uh, deletions actually truncated a gene called MUT-S, which is a DNA repair, encoded DNA repair protein. And we believe this provides the explanation for why there was suddenly an increase in the mutation rate in this lineage, that you've lost DNA repair, and that led to an increase in, 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 in the mutation rate, which accounted for the fact you had 18 SNPs here in a relatively short time. <coughs> 
interestingly, since we made this observation, uh, uh, one of the other people working in this area, Sharon Peacock in Cambridge, has reported that the homologous gene Mutes in Staphylococcus aureus was mutated in the lineage that she was studying, and she saw an increase in the um, SNP acquisition rate in that particular lineage in a completely different organism in Staph aureus. And I don't know how much you've done on cancer. Have you done much on cancer and cancer genomics? This is a similar sort of thing that we see in the evolution of cancer, which is that you see acquisition, well, actually you see loss of DNA repair mechanisms, and that leads to a, a speeding up in the, a, a genomic instability, speeding up in mutation rates and genomic instability. So it's interesting to see, when you look at this kind of level, you are seeing commonalities across what it might look at first sight, quite unrelated things. Recently, we are, well, at the current time, we're actually looking at a new outbreak uh, with a new uh, outbreak strain. In fact, this is a slightly old slide. I think we're probably about week 70 now, and in fact, the outbreak seems to be over. Um, I don't think my clinical colleagues like me reporting that, that, in fact, there have been deaths linked to the outbreak, but they have. It was typed by the Health Detection Agency, and they said, oh, yes, this is a unique type. It's, we call it Pulsar Type 27, but that's all they could tell us. So we have obtained 69 isolates from 29 patients. Uh, we've sequenced, genome sequenced 36 of them. And we've been able to uh, tease out the uh, transmission chain. So this um, is a rather crudely drawn diagram. It's our first attempt at trying to draw a diagram. We're going to get better at this over time. But basically, the numbers are the number at which the patient, uh, the order in which the patients actually were admitted to hospital. And the, the arrows are what we uh, reconstruct as transmission events uh, that co correspond to a SNP change. You can see that some transmission events are they're obviously between different patients. They're all carrying the same genotype. So three patients, three, five, eight, 11, 13, all have the same genotype, similar to in our first outbreak. So it's not always the case that you get a new, a new patient, a new transmission, you're going to get a new SNP. But the heartening thing for us was that actually if you look over time here, the hour of time is pointing in that direction there, we are seeing a steady acquisition of SNPs during the outbreak. So we're actually having a, an interpretation here that kind of makes sense with our prior assumptions. There, you know, devil's advocate view that's been put to us is, that, well, all these SNPs you see, they're just random variations that happen in the lab when you subculture. Well, if that were the case, we wouldn't expect to see the later strains having you know, four or five more SNPs than the early strains. We, you know, it could be any strain anywhere in the, uh, in the outbreak would have had a large number of SNPs or a small number of SNPs. We've been able to actually work out by looking at where the patients were, which wards they were on, and that kind of stuff, that there were overlaps between them that made sense. They were on the same ward at the same time, and so forth. So, for most of this, there are just a few. This is oh, this hasn't gone long with that arrow, but there were just a few things where it didn't quite make sense. Um, the three complex transmission to this six seven chain here. There wasn't actually a direct link in terms of patients being in adjacent beds, but we think that there was some shared equipment there. Um, and then similarly, this patient 16 and the transmission to uh, for this 14 and 15, again, it was thought that perhaps there were those environmental spread because these patients had been to the same Burns theatre within a relatively short period of time. So they, although they may have not been on the same ward or next to each other in the ward, they had actually had the opportunity to, to cross-contaminate. Anyway, that, so that's what we've been doing with the hospital stuff. I, I just now, for five or ten minutes, take you through a kind of roller coaster of an adventure that we had last summer. Um, you may have heard in the news that there was this outbreak of E. coli in Germany associated with sprouting seeds. Some waggers nicknamed it the sprout break as a result of that. Over 4,000, in fact, over 5,000 cases, and I think now over 50 deaths associated with that. This particular kind of E. coli causes a syndrome called hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, where it causes damage to the kidneys, damage to the brain, causes uh, anemia. Uh, 
For some reason, females are particularly at risk in this outbreak. One potential explanation is that real men don't eat bean sprouts. That's just a facetious explanation. You know, there probably is some, I don't think, I've not heard of any cogent epidemiological explanation for that at the moment. You can see from this map here that the outbreak was centred on northern Germany, although uh, bits of Germany else, other parts, people were affecting other parts of Germany. In fact, people who had been in Germany at the time of the outbreak then travelled to other countries as well. And uh, so the, um, the cases did crop up even here in the UK. You can see it peaked in uh, uh, around the third week of May. And as you can see, in terms of the, the, the darker grey there is females and the lighter grey uh, males, that there was indeed a, uh, a predominance for cases in um, females. Now, uh, at the centre of this was the University Clinic Eppendorf in Hamburg. And they actually happened to have a connection uh, through one of their postdocs to a major genome sequencing centre in China. So they actually extracted DNA from uh, one of the isolates that they had from the outbreak, and they sent that to this genome sequencing centre in China, BGI at Shenzhen. And BGI had just acquired a, a new benchtop sequencing uh, instrument called the Iron Torrent, uh, which had a very short run time. So they thought, oh, we'll just quickly run this through here and see what we get. And um, they decided... They had a feeling that yeah, there was a thing, feeling from Germany and from China. Or actually, they should put their mark down quickly and get their data out of the public domain. So they released their paper, into, their, their data into public domain very quickly. And then this guy here, Nick Lowen, who works with me, used to work for me, now works with me on his own fellowship. He um, he'd been gearing up to analyse data from this instrument because I happened to have won one of these instruments actually, you know quite a raffle, but in a European-wide competition, we just just got hold of one. So we were working out how to analyse the data. So he, he took that data and analysed it, assembled it into a, a kind of draft genome sequence, and then put out this call on a, a blog. You know, so both he and I were really keen on blogs and Twitter and so forth. He happened to be at actually at a, a conference on the, epi the genomic epidemiology at the time, and he just called on all his fellow bioinformaticians there and around the world that's Let's just see what we can do with this data. Um, and in response to his call, he'd assembled the data within 24 hours of its release. But in another day, there's a guy who blogs under the name of Mike the Mad Biologist. His real name is Mike Feldgarten. But he'd actually uh, ferried around in this, da in this sequence data and looked at a, a big database of the epidemiology of E. coli that was already available. And, and pointed out, actually, this strain wasn't a completely new strain, as had been touted. I think that there had been some hype by the Chinese, uh, BGI, and, and others, that this was like the, the, a new, completely new strain, never before, before seen on the planet, you know, like the Andromeda strain. But in fact, he said, no, no, there was something similar in Germany associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome a few years before. Within five days, there was a strain-specific diagnostic test release, so PCR primers to specifically identify this strain from colonies on, on, on agar very quickly. And within a week, actually, over two dozen reports have been posted on this uh, so-called so open source <laughs> wiki, where people all around the world had actually documented uh, what their findings we were actually lucky to be at the centre of that. Uh, we got into collaboration with uh, the, the guys in Germany uh, and uh, the team in, in China and actually marshaled all this together. And it, it was a bit of an undertaking to sort of try and get all this data together. Uh, and it was unclear who we were going to allow in from this crowdsourcing consortium as authors. And in the end, we actually just gave them an auth the authorship as a, as a consortium. But this was written up and, and published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine last summer, which got us a lot of brownie points because it's a very high-impact journal. Actually, back-to-back -back with us, there was another group that used an alternative sequence of technology called PacBio, um, who published uh, a genomic analysis of the outbreak strain from Germany, but also some, other, some of those related strains that had already been earmarked as being related um, and provided some data on that as well. And as I say, I, there was a lot of 
issues about who's going to get authorship. And I'm very pleased that when this went into PubMed, um, the collaborators who were in that consortium actually got get named in PubMed. So it gives them some recognition. Takeaway messages from that outbreak. Well, it's, you know, infection is still a big problem, even in places like Germany, where they have the highest standard of living. Pathogens don't bother with passports. As I say, not a new strain. Something seen in Germany before then, and in Korea, in fact. And, in fact, the closest strain, genome sequence strain at that time was from cent the Central African Republic. One of the interesting things was that this was a, from a completely unexpected lineage. I won't go into the details, but it's a lineage we call enterogative E. coli. Um, and this is a kind of lineage that tends to circulate in human populations. So normally when you get this kind of infection, as you may know, there's been a problem here in Birmingham, in Sutton Park, in, in, in recent times, with uh, E. coli 0157. And the finger there points at the what that these cows and whatever that grazing in the park and crapping out all over the grass and leaving their, their manure there. Um, here, the, the finger was pointing at, actually, this is probably human-to-human -human spread or some human uh, source in the loop. It hasn't been identified. I mean, the sprouts and the seeds have been identified as a, as a likely culprit, but quite how they got contaminated, we don't know. There's a lot of evolution that went on in this, in this, pro, in this lineage in terms of uh, acquisition of profiles and all sorts. I won't go into detail, but the time's got to move on. I mean, what we thought was quite cool about this was that actually we'd done something, we, we called it open source genomics. Uh, it had been this high throughput sequencing done by the, the BGI. We'd called in this crowdsourced analyses, and everyone in that kind of analysis was sharing their, their, their results very quickly, you know, on a daily basis. And this is quite unlike what happens with quote unquote normal research, where people keep their lab books close to their chest. And what's going on in their research program until the, the day they're ready to submit and then they submit it in confidence and then the day it's published in a proper journal, the world knows about it. Here, everyone knew about what was going on instantly. And many of my colleagues think that blogging and Twitter are just a time, total waste of time on a par with Facebook as a way of just completely destroying your ability to get anything done. Uh, whereas we showed that actually no, they actually can be useful and augment the usual channels of academic discourse. In fact, I did set up on some of my courses up Facebook pages, and then the students complained to me afterwards. They said, "I wish you hadn't put all that stuff on Facebook because once I got onto Facebook, I couldn't get off, and I spent the whole evening on Facebook instead of doing any work, and it's all your fault." So, yeah, there are, there are arguments for and against. Um, you know, in effect, we called on the, the wisdom of the masses here. It's kind of like the swarm brain of humanity against this, all these bacteria trying to mutate away. I'm not sure that, that everyone will be doing this in the future, but I think it will become the norm for public health emergencies. So the next time there is some big outbreak, people are going to have to get used to releasing data, doing stuff quickly, talking to each other in a way that is not the, the norm in science. Um, I'll, I will leave that point about Ingle Finger. This is us celebrating. Right, so that covers most of, of the stuff in terms of individual organisms and kind of pure culture. Now you can argue that actually you're still piggybacking on the stuff that you're trying to get rid of. You're growing stuff on plates and then you're picking that stuff up and picking up the colonies and sequencing. Well, one of the things we're interested in is looking at communities of, of microorganisms, so perhaps not assuming that one headline organism is the culprit in this particular condition, but maybe that whole community of bacteria is contributing to the balance between health and disease. And also saying, well, could we actually just get rid of the culture and use sequencing directly on the samples? And this just, uh, in, in my own group, we, we have these chicken microbiome project where we're looking at what lives in chicken gut and that's fairly well established and we're starting to establish these kind of approaches within a trauma centre that we've established in collaboration between the university, the hospital and the, the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. Now culture independent pathogen discovery, it's worth pointing out, we, we bacteriologists we're kind of swaggering at the moment, oh we can do genomes but we're always 10 years behind the virologists 
viral genomes are a lot smaller than bacterial genomes, but virologists have been doing culture-independent pathogen discovery for the last few years now. There's been a number of headline cases where if you just extract, in these cases, RNA from the patient, make cDNA, and then sequence it en masse, you can find a few reads that align to a virus and make a diagnosis. In bacteriology, there's been a lot of interest over, I don't know, probably two decades or so, at one particular molecular barcode, which is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. So this is the ribosomal RNA as it folds up, and it's got various conserved regions and um, variable regions. And the idea is that you design PCR primers based on the conserved regions, and they allow you to amplify up the variable regions, which kind of give you a, a barcoding of that whole complex community. The advantages of this is that it's pretty near universal. Um, all bacteria have ribosomes, and so they all have ribosomal RNA, and the, and the conserved regions are pretty well conserved. And there is this massive knowledge database now, knowledge base out there. We've got tens, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of these sequences out there. And, and so, you know, working out what you've got and comparing it to that, there, there is a kind of prior art there. There are problems, though, because... With, we've got problems with cell lysis. Not all bacterial cells are going to lyse and yield up their DNA so equally well. Primer binding can be an issue. So these so-called universal primer binding sites, they're not actually universal. Um, and with the PCR process of amplifying, you sometimes get artifacts coming from that. So you might get the front half of one molecule somehow during that PCR manages to just knock into the back end of another molecule and you end up with a, what we call a chimera which doesn't actually represent a sequence that was in the original starting material. So there are all sorts of problems. I've used the term here, the one-eyed king, I think it's uh, H.G. Wells, I think it was, that used this phrase, that in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And, and so this is the industry standard, but we're all kind of aware that it's not perfect yet as, a, as an approach and that better will come. But it's been used. Uh, here's a paper from last year where they were using these kind of approaches looking at wound care and showing that if you use these kind of culture independent approaches and compare them with what you get from culture in terms of microbiology and you tailor your treatment to what you're detecting, you get a better outcome if you use the culture independent approaches. Nick Lohman, who I mentioned earlier, has just got this MRC uh, fellowship and he's going to be looking at cystic fibrosis and looking at the complex microbial communities that live inside the cystic fibrosis lung using these kind of approaches um, and, and as well. I'm running out of time, but we'll just put in a few slides just to kind of, you probably have heard this from microbiology lectures, but basically all of us are carrying this so-called microbiota this collection of microorganisms that we carry around. And in some ways, you can argue that we're actually kind of chimeric organisms ourselves, superorganisms built from your traditional human cells that you study in cell biology and all those microbial cells. Uh, Julian Davis, a famous Canadian microbiologist, has, has even gone to the point that, you know, that the most interesting thing about a human is that it's a large, highly complex microbial community attached to some relatively uninteresting organic matter. It's a very bacteriology chauvinist view, but uh, it, 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 you know, the argument's being made that this is, in effect, a complex multicellular organ, as complex as the liver. It's clear that this third genome, sometimes called the microbiome, actually has many more genes in it than actually in your human nuclear genome. And there's this thing called the Human Microbiome Project, which is, is, is like the equivalent of, uh, equivalent of the Human Genome Project, but applied to this microbiome. Um, and this microbiota, you know, it's all over us. Topologically, we're just like a donut, so all the stuff that's in your gut is actually external to you topologically, and the microbiome lives there. And there's a huge uh, range of stuff there. And it has all sorts of beneficial effects, I'm rushing through this. It has 
effects on assimilation of nutrients, uh, breaking down polysaccharides and all that sort of stuff. It can also play a role in disease. And this is where the, the, there's been a lot of interest lately in this interaction between that microbiota and the host and how it is actually influencing the outcome of conditions that you wouldn't normally think of as infection. So the hygiene hypothesis, the fact that people are getting asthma and eczema more, to do their exposure to these kind of organisms. The gut microbiota implicated in the pathogenesis of cancer, inflammatory bowel disease. It's clear that there's some kind of abnormal immune response to the, the gut microbiota, but there's probably not that simple. It's probably a complex interplay. Even irritable bowel syndrome, same diabetes. And one of the hot topics at the moment is the, is the link between the gut microbiota and and weight and obesity. So it's clear that there are differences in the composition of that microbiota between obese and lean individuals, and individuals who were obese and then dieted and became lean. And in fact, there's been one experiment done, a very provocative experiment, where they took the microbiota from obese mice and put it into lean mice, and it led to weight gain in those lean mice. So there's uh, one of early papers, 2006, where they, they showed that. There's this guy, Jeffrey Gordon, who's been at the forefront of, of, of these kind of efforts. Um, here's, I just grabbed these quickly. There's a couple of other papers, and one from around the same time, early, uh, you know, mid-2000s, where the first hint that obesity and gut microbial ecology were linked. Here, here's a more recent and much more sophisticated view, which is that you've got this so-called dysbiosis. It's not an infection, it's a derangement of the microbial ecology, a dysbiosis, which is mediated <coughs> through the inflammasome, and there's this complex cross talk between the microbiota and the immune system, uh, leading to, or at least predisposing to, uh, infections. Um, to, 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 to non-infectious conditions like obesity and here non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'm going to close with, with literally in the last two minutes now. One of the things we're interested in doing is, is actually can we just sequence the ship? We call it ship sequence. We're trying to think of a nice uh, what, what we can actually make that an acronym of but we haven't actually come up with that yet. But, but basically, you take this and you turn it into sequence. Could that work as a diagnostic modality? And in fact, this is the Oxford uh, group's figure. But here, we've, we've sliced out all that stuff about media and, and different kinds of culture media. Just take your samples and sequence them in, in, directly in the sequence, or extract DNA from them and sequence that. Would that give us the same kind of readout? Well, we have some grounds for optimism. We, with our German colleagues, we have... They have stayed, saved some of the, the stool samples from that German outbreak, and they've extracted DNA and sent that to us, and we have sequenced it. And we've been able to recover the genome sequence of the outbreak strain from that so-called metagenome, just all the DNA, all the sequences, just a shotgun sequence, blunderbuss approach. But within there, we can see all of that genome uh, and when we align against that genome, we're getting about 20-fold coverage of the genome, which is actually pretty good. And one interesting thing is there's a little upswing there. You can see at one uh, position in the genome, and that's where the, the bacteriophage, bacterial virus, sits in the genome. So the genome it integrates into the genome, it sits there as part of the genome, and it behaves in a kind of uh, well-behaved way as far as the bacteria is concerned for most of the time, but Every now and then, it decides to break open the cell and produce many, many copies of itself. And so what you'd expect to see, if you look at the whole metagenome, is many more copies of that phage genome than there is of the host genome. That's indeed what we see. Uh, so it, it is all giving us a very interesting uh, angle. This is all very preliminary. We're actually doing another study starting on Monday to sequence a few more of these. And we hope to get it all written up by the end of the month because there's a, a special edition of it. The Journal of the American uh, Medical Association want to get into. Um, so that's where we're at with that. So I hope I persuaded you that, that high throughput sequencing, genome sequencing, has got many advantages. It's a very exciting thing to be doing at the moment. Platforms themselves have defined strengths and weaknesses. I haven't perhaps put enough in about 
the microbiome and the interplay between these microbial communities, but culture-independent approaches and study of the microbiome are really interdigitated and, and driving each other forward. One of the things that's worth stressing, though, is that we ain't seen nothing yet because our current technologies, yeah, they're 10, 100 folds uh, more expensive than we'd like. They probably could be do with being 10 times quicker as well. And there is something around the corner. Earlier in the year, I think it was in February, there's a company called Oxford Nanopore in Oxford who uh, made a press release at a uh, conference talking about what they're, they're called nanopore sequencing, where you basically have a, a membrane, you have a little hole through it, nanopore, you thread the DNA through it, and you read the sequence of the DNA as it goes through in each individual strands as they're going through. And they seem to have got that to work, and they say that they will very soon be releasing this technology in the format of a USB stick, that you pipette your sample into the USB stick, it reads the sequence within the USB stick, and the sequence then cascades onto your computer in real time. Now that is cool, and it's going to cost about five hundred pounds for one of those USB sticks. So it's still a little bit expensive, but sorry? well, that's it. it was probably about a hundred meg, I think they were saying. So. For our purpose, for microbacterial purposes, it probably would be good enough. We are desperate, and the whole of the world is desperate to get our hands on this technology, and we've been waiting since February, and that's why I put hope or hype, because they haven't actually released the technology yet, and we're all waiting. They said it would come in, in the last quarter of the year, maybe a few weeks away, or it may be that they just told a load of old porkies to get their venture capitalists to give them a bit more money, um, and we're going to have to wait forever or for a lot much longer. Uh, but even if they don't produce this technology, there are others working on similar technologies around the world. And so, you know, I, I expect we will see another step change uh, before long with this technology. Yeah. There are, we actually blogged on... You know, there are endless possibilities that become open to you if you could just walk around with a USB stick. Could you diagnose your own microbiology? Yeah, but the actual interpretation of sequence data is pretty sophisticated. It's not impossible to think of devising a program in a pipeline that might take all of the hard work out of it. But that's a big, big wave of the hand to say that it could be done, but it's, it's possible. Another thing is that you might want to go out, you know, if you were out in Sutton Park, you might go and get a bit, a bit of cow shit, put it in there and say, that one's got 0157, it's the same outbreak strain as the kids had last week, you know, this is, we're hot on the trailer, this is where it's coming from. You could actually do field studies in the field there and then, you know, go out for an afternoon and come back with all that data. I mean, this is, we're, we're in a, it's, it's a roller coaster at the moment, it's just an astonishing time because the technological developments are just opening up new vistas all the time. Anyway, the problem is that we can be, we're in a university here and we can do all this great stuff in the research environment, but how do we translate that into a real world diagnostic environment? Particularly as our colleagues over the road are rather conservative in their approaches, and unless they can see this clearly has superior performance and it's cost effective, they ain't going to do it. And also, you know, you could argue that TV is a better. Uh, communication medium than uh, radio, but nonetheless radio has survived because there are niches where it is better. And the same may be true of traditional microbiology. We, though we might want to wipe out all that's gone before, it probably isn't going to be that simple. Let's be fanciful and, and let's just make a biblical metaphor. You know, here's Moses looking at the promised land, all those sequences in the distance. You know, the promised land is like, we've still got many rivers to cross before we get there. Uh, in fact, we wrote a little thing on this in, in genome medicine. Um, and in fact, just as I finish this, I've got to correct the proofs of something that's coming out of nature biotechnology in the next few weeks as well, making similar points. Well, I just acknowledge all the people I work with who do all the work. I just sit in my office and look out the window uh, but, and raise the money and write the papers, but they're the ones that do the hard work. Um, oh, I've got two acknowledgement slides. And there's our blog post, a blog if you're interested, and Twitter if you want to do that. And there's my YouTube 
you can just Google me and type YouTube and you'll find lots of other talks on this kind of stuff. There we go. So I've spent, wasted a whole hour of your time. Has anyone got any... You've asked some questions. You've got any more questions? You want the USB stick and you want my... Let's just uh, stop recording.